Hello, I'm Stuart Molina, music director of the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra. And today I'm here to discuss the music that we'll be playing in our first concert of the 2020-21 season. Um, it's three pieces for string orchestra, uh, although one of them does have a harpsichord. Um, these are three pieces that were written in different periods of musical history. Um, the first from the late 19th century, the second from earlier in the 19th century, and the third from the Baroque period, oh, over a hundred years before that. Um, we'll talk first about the Elgar Serenade. Edward Elgar uh, was one of the greatest of the British composers, certainly the greatest of the British Romantic composers. Um, he achieved his greatest fame uh, when he uh, wrote the Enigma Variations. Um, but before he wrote that, when he was still a relatively unknown composer, he wrote this beautiful piece, the Serenade for Strings. Um, of course, there are other serenades for strings in the Romantic period, pieces like Tchaikovsky and Dvorak. This is a much more compact piece. It only runs about 12 minutes or so, um, but it is filled with beautiful melodies, beautiful harmonies, uh, and wonderful emotion. Of course, the whole idea of the Romantic period is writing music with emotion. Romantic doesn't so much mean love as it means music with affect, music with um, emotional ideas tied to it or emotional ideas behind it. Um, the Elgar Serenade was written in 1892. Uh, Elgar was in his early 30s. Um, and this ended up being one of his favorite pieces of all the pieces that he wrote in his career. Um, late in his life, uh, only a couple of years before he died, he put out one final recording, uh, and he included in that recording the Serenade for Strings, which he always described uh, as a piece that was very dear to his heart. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Serenade. It's in three movements. Um, the first one is interestingly uh, marked Allegro Piacevole. Uh, piacevole is the Italian word for pleasant, and so we're talking about something that's pleasantly quick. Um, it's interesting to me just because the piece in my mind is one that's slightly tormented, certainly, certainly a little bit agitated. And you feel that right at the beginning uh, when the violas open with a, a, a kind of agitated motive. <laughs> um, and this immediately opens up into a beautiful melody uh, in the full string section. feel that there's emotion to this music. But what creates that emotion? What are the musical tricks uh, that Elgar and a lot of the other romantics use to create the sense of longing, the sense of, uh, of agitation, of emotional unrest? Uh, I'm just going to discuss one of these because we really don't have lots of time, um, and that is the appoggiatura. An appoggiatura is a note, um, it literally means a leaning note, a note that is a dissonance that must resolve into a consonance. Uh, let me give you an example. So for example, if you have a G major chord, the appoggiatura could be that has to resolve to, or perhaps an E minor chord that has an F sharp. So you hear how the note kind of leans on what the harmony is going to eventually resolve to, and at the same time, it creates the sense of urgency, the sense perhaps of longing, um, certainly a sense of heightened emotion. And Elgar's music is just filled with this, particularly this piece. So if we listen to this first melody, second bar of this, you hear an appoggiatura. That has to resolve. And you're going to hear this again and again and again in this very beautiful piece. Um, so the entire first movement is not one of longing and agitation. There are moments um, that are much lighter. The second theme that we're going to hear almost sounds like ballet music. It's kind of light and, and, uh, and delightful. But even there, he throws in an appoggiatura just for, uh, for the sake of it. And let me play that again.
there's your appoggiatura. It has to resolve down. There's another theme that you'll hear in this movement, uh, and in both the first and second movement, you get uh, second themes um, that are uh, contrasting from the first one. In this one, we have it very silently uh, stated, um, and it's in a beautiful major key of E major uh, compared to the E minor that we started with. It's just kind of a beautiful contrast. It takes us into a different world before returning to the urgency uh, and emotion of the first theme. The second movement um, is the emotional centerpiece as well as the physical centerpiece of this serenade. Um, it's extraordinarily beautiful. It's called Larghetto, which means not incredibly slow, but a slow-ish movement. Um, but right away, uh, we have a, a heightened sense of passion in a beautiful line that starts with just the first violins. It's extremely beautiful. It's beautifully voiced with different voices emerging at different times playing this opening motive. Um, but here too, he features in this melody repeated use of the appoggiatura. So right away, has to resolve down. And then it's answered in the second violins. Another appoggiatura. Another appoggiatura. Big appoggiatura. Before resolving. Um, so I point this out just because your ear will get used to hearing these things. And it's kind of nice to know. In a, in a sense, uh, Elgar's toying with your emotions. I mean, it's almost like a movie... Uh, that pulls at your heartstrings very deliberately. The use of the appoggiatura in this piece is doing just that. Every time he throws in an appoggiatura, it's with the intention of heightening the emotion of the piece. And I think it's extremely successful. Uh, and I don't complain at all about having my heartstrings pulled. Um, rather, it's one of the reasons I love this piece, because it's so blatantly emotional, so hard on your sleeve. Um, so, the last movement um, is a little bit nostalgic. Um, and it's kind of on the short side. It begins with this lovely uh, kind of fantasy. Uh, and you get this kind of beautiful melody that goes in and out of the part, starting with the violas. And so we live in this very beautiful world of G major for a while, um, but eventually we do return uh, to the music of the opening movement, uh, and he brings it to a beautiful close. We first hear the, uh, the second theme, that beautiful major theme, but now in a very subdued way. Uh, and then finally he does bring back the opening melody before bringing this piece to a beautiful close. Um, I really hope you'll enjoy our performance of it. The second piece on our program uh, is by the great Baroque composer Antonio Vivaldi. This was written in the early part of the 18th century, I believe in 1811, um, and it's part of a set of 12 concertos um, called Lestro Armonico. Um, Lestro Armonico means harmonic inspiration. Um, this, as I said, is a concerto for four violins. Now, this is not unique in Vivaldi's output. Uh, Vivaldi, in fact, wrote almost 500 uh, concertos, and at least half of those were written for solo violin. But he also wrote concertos for two violins, concertos for four violins, 
Um, he was an incredibly prolific composer, and it's rather astonishing, given the rather limited harmonic and motivic world that was the Baroque. Um, Vivaldi was one of the great creative geniuses of the time and wrote some incredibly beautiful music. Um, and so what's interesting to me about this piece is the way that he uses the four violins, particularly in the third movement, which I'll get into in a moment, uh, but also um, what he's able to do with a relatively small amount of material. Um, there are a couple of ways that Baroque composers um, used material to keep things interesting. Um, one of them is just through variation, and immediately in this piece, we have a sense of that. It begins in B minor, um, and it stays kind of in B minor. You just have... That's pretty much the harmonic accompaniment. We do have a cadence that it goes to. Um, but he gives you an interesting uh, development of melody, even in just the first four measures. So he starts with just the single note, the fifth of the B minor chord. Then he varies that. And then he further varies it, even with the use of a trill. And then he brings us to the cadence. So as you're listening to this piece, Listen to the ways that he makes subtle adjustments uh, to melodies to keep them interesting. Even though the harmonies may not change very much, uh, the melodies uh, always do slightly to keep you uh, engaged. The second thing that he does, which I find extremely interesting, is he uses phrases of kind of strange lengths. I mean, your standard phrase uh, is going to be a two-bar phrase. Um, uh, so somewhere into this first movement, we have a, a phrase that goes like this. So why is this odd? Well, because it's a one and a half bar phrase. It's not a two bar phrase. If it were a two bar phrase, it might sound something like this. has a very comfortable, you know, two and two and two. It feels very nice. But what he does is he cuts that off by half a bar. And so in this feeling of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, he suddenly throws in one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four. So listen to it again. <laughs> Sounds like a, a triple meter piece rather than a quadruple meter piece. Um, so he'll do this quite a lot, and we have five and a half bar phrases, three and a half bar phrases, sometimes even longer uh, phrases that have that extra half bar. Again, just because he always keeps you kind of on edge, what you're expecting doesn't always happen. Um, so the other things that I'd like to point out are two harmonic techniques. Um, they're related, and they all are based around the idea of the circle of fifths. Um, tonal harmony is based around the cadence, which is, you know, in the simplest sense, G to C, so the end of a piece. G, C. But you can then use the C as the note that's going to go in the next cadence. So you would have, and then that C goes to an F, and then that F to a B flat. And so on. This is called the circle of fifths because if you continue doing it, it's going to go all around the circle through all of the 12 tones and get back to where you started. Now, you're not going to hear the complete circle of fifths in this piece. That would be uh, insane and a little bit insipid. Um, but rather, you're going to hear bursts of circle of fifths that may go on for four or five measures, may go on for four or five segments in the circle of fifths. And these are usually done through sequences. A sequence is a, uh, a, a motive, a melody, um, that follows a certain harmonic contour and then repeats in a different key, and it keeps segmenting. And in the case of this piece, a lot of the time, it's going to be along the circle of fifths. So let me find an example of this. 
So. So what's he doing? Well, he starts out with a measure in F sharp minor. Goes to C sharp, which is the uh, the five tone, the, the, the note in the cadence uh, for F sharp. Then he has, we're back at F sharp minor. Now listen to this. It's a very simple melody. But it's a melody that constantly is changing harmony along the circle of fifth. So we have F sharp, B, E, A, D, G. And then he changes it slightly to get back into B minor. But you're going to hear this a lot. It's a very typical Baroque sounding musical technique, the circle of fifths. The other one um, that I wanted to point out is kind of similar, but in this one, uh, instead of a circle of fifths that's going to take you uh, sequentially down, this will take you up. And the idea is you want to, let's say you're starting in E major, and you want to go to F sharp major. What you do is you do E major, and then go down a third to go up, then down a third to go up, then down a third. And again, you can keep doing this. It's not quite a circle of fifths because you're jumping a few steps, but it's a similar kind of sequential uh, figure. Um, and Bach is completely full of this. So the second movement uh, is very short and it's kind of a, a, a majestic statement of chords. Not really much happens in this piece except a moment for the, uh, for the audience, the listener, to catch his or her breath uh, before we get to the third movement, which I think is the most fascinating uh, for me in terms of his use of the four violins. Um, I'm just going to take the first two measures and talk about what he does with the four soloists. He gives them chords, arpeggios, and arpeggio is a, a chord broken up into its component notes. Um, but he gives each of them different ways of presenting the arpeggio uh, and different articulations of violin technique um, to create a very magical texture. So the first violin soloist is playing very fast. These are 32nd notes that are playing a, an expanded version of the arpeggio. This is a very typical kind of figure for the violin. Because it has multiple strings, the bow can go quickly from one string to the next and create these fast arpeggios. So again, you have 30 second notes, very quick. The second part um, is playing downward arpeggios half as fast with a three slurred one separate articulation. So three smooth notes and then one separate note. And so on. The third part is playing the opposite direction. So arpeggio is going up and down rather than down and up. And this time separate on every single note. And then finally, the fourth part is just playing the bottom two notes of the arpeggio and articulating them as two slurred notes, uh, followed by two slurred notes, followed by two slurred notes. So, baya, 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 or... I'm not even going to attempt to try to play them all together for you because it would, it would just sound like mush. But when you listen to this piece, think about the genius that's involved in taking just a very simple harmonic progression uh, and creating something so fascinating just through the use of different articulations and different speed of notes. The last movement is a dance movement. I'm not going to play any of it for you. Um, it features all of the same techniques that I talked about with the first movement. Um, you'll get your sequences, you'll get your circle of fifths, you'll get lots of variation. Um, and most of all, you get an absolutely delightful finish to this delightful piece. The third piece on our program is Mendelssohn's String Symphony No. 8 in D major. Um, when Mendelssohn was a mere 12 years old, 
he embarked on a project over the next two years, um, writing 13 string symphonies. Um, these were an assignment from his teacher at the time, uh, and he was supposed to emulate the styles of the great, great classical composers like C.P.E. Bach, um, Haydn, and Mozart. Um, it's unavoidable to see uh, the influence particularly of Mozart in this number eight, uh, one of the more mature, quote unquote, of the string symphonies written when he was a, uh, a, a ripe old 14 years old. Um, but what you certainly do see is the genius of Mendelssohn. Uh, this is a spectacular work, and it was a work that Mendelssohn himself really liked, uh, so much so that right after he wrote it, you know, within the next several weeks, he then orchestrated it beyond strings, um, adding woodwinds, brasses, and timpani, uh, and creating what I suppose you can think of as his first full symphony. Um, but I actually love the original string version best. I think that it's, uh, it's delightful. Um, it's full of youthful energy, beautiful melodies, um, and a brilliance of counterpoint um, that I think might be unrivaled in any composer that I know of. Um, even Mozart in his earliest days didn't write music that was this mature in its conception. Uh, the piece is in four movements, like most symphonies. Um, what's interesting about the first and last movements is although they're in sonata form, um, which I'm not going to get into here, but the basic idea of sonata form is two themes, uh, in an exposition, followed by a development, which takes the themes and messes around with them, and then you have a restatement of the themes uh, in the recapitulation. Um, but in this particular piece, the material is the same for the two themes. He doesn't work with lots and lots of motivic material, and yet he's able to fashion a piece with incredible variety, and you never get the sense that he's reusing things ad nauseum. Again, it's a tribute to his inspiration uh, and to his brilliance. Uh, and so the beginning of the piece uh, is typical for a classical style symphony. It begins with an adagio, a, uh, a slow section. And although the piece itself is in D major, he begins with an introduction in minor. And it's a very dramatic um, opening followed by a rather mysterious, uh, slow, quiet uh, exposition that you'll hear in the strings. so forth. Um, you'll hear this opening uh, majestic statement, jam, ba -bam, um, that will come at the same time as the slow moving uh, music that came right after it um, as he works his way through this introduction. Uh, and then it reaches a cadence very quietly. And then suddenly you have a delightful allegro melody. It's a very typical kind of uh, classical melody, um, and it's beautifully orchestrated. Um, and then he starts working around with it, and what he comes up with soon thereafter um, is a counter theme. And I think it's worth mentioning this theme because it really ties into the, uh, uh, the relationship with Mozart in terms of ins ins inspiration for this piece. And you might even think of this piece in a sense of uh, as, a, uh, as an homage to Mozart, and, and this is the theme that you'll hear. So a lot of people have said that this is reminiscent of Mozart's 38th symphony, um, and I can certainly see that it also is in D major, and it fe features a similar contour to this melody. Let's see if I can get this one right. melody I just played from the string symphony. But in my mind, um, it's much more reminiscent of the Magic Flute Overture. Um, the Magic Flute Overture, of course. Uh... And so forth. And the reason why I say the Magic Flute rather than the, uh, the 38th symphony 
um, is because of the reliance on counterpoint. Now, of course, the magic flute is late in Mozart's career when he was at the peak of his powers. Mendelssohn um, is at the earliest stages of his compositional career. Um, but clearly, Mendelssohn knew the Magic Flute Overture. This is a piece that's filled with all kinds of counterpoint, fugal material, particularly when we get to the last movement. Um, and so for this particular theme that I just played for you, I think that uh, I'm going to go with the Magic Flute. Um, and in fact, I'll come back to that at the end of this movement, because I think there's a moment that even makes that clearer. Um, but at any rate, so we have this, this beautiful interplay of this rather jolly second uh, piece of material and the opening melody. And then there's one other that I suppose I should play for you as well. Um, let's see, what shall I play? Um. <laughs> Um, you'll hear that melody uh, interplaying with the other two as well. Um, so, um, other than that, it's a fairly typical uh, opening movement. Um, but we do get to the end. After a rather robust development, he returns. He has a fake return uh, in the wrong key, and then he has a real return in the correct key. This is also very much in, uh, in keeping with the music of Mozart, who did that kind of thing all the time. But when we get to the end of the movement... Um, we have something that once again is reminiscent of the Magic Flute Overture. Just to give you a, uh, a memory of the Magic Flute Overture, the end has a section like this. Um, actually, I might as well play it on. piece, again, we're no longer in E-flat, we're in D major, so it's going to sound immediately a little bit jarring. Um, but this is how Mendelssohn ends his first movement. Oh, sorry, one more time. to me that this is music that's uh, der derived from the Magic Flute Overture. So I'm going to take on any musicologist that uh, disagrees with me, but that is my take. Moving to the second movement, um, this is a very unique uh, movement as far as I know in terms of the repertoire of this time. Um, it's written entirely for low strings. Um, so you just have the bass, the cello, um, and three violin, uh, uh, three violas. Um, kind of the, the alto to bass voices of the string chorus. Um, it's a very soft-spoken movement. Um, and again, the amount of motivic material is not that great, um, but it's very moving. I'll give you just an idea of, uh, of the main melody. plays out in a very beautiful way. It's not a very long movement, um, but it's a total contrast to what we had in the first movement, both in terms of the, 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 the soft-spoken motivic material as opposed to the bright and cheerful material of the first movement, um, but also because of the orchestration. Um, because you only hear these low voices, it gives it a warmth and a mystery that I think is, uh, is quite infectious. Um, the third movement is a minuet, which is very typical of the time. Um, but clearly, this is a minuet that's written uh, in the style of late Mozart and even of early Beethoven, just in terms of the tempos. He marks rather quick tempos for this minuet, as opposed to the more stately minuet of, uh, of early Mozart or, uh, or Haydn. Um, other than that, it's a fairly typical uh, minuet. I'll just play a little bit of the opening. <laughs> plays out quite beautifully for a while, and the trio is even faster. It's almost at the tempo of a Beethoven scherzo. Um, well, I can play a little of this too. And so forth. So instead of one, two, three, it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, 
Again, clearly this is written in the Romantic period. We're in the early uh, 19th century. We're no longer in the 18th century. Uh, Mendelssohn has a lot of different music in his ears, and he's young and anxious to prove himself. Um, and he's developing his own voice as well. So it's not surprising that he would take a, a later kind of approach uh, to a minuet. Finally, the last movement is a typical uh, allegro molto, or presto movement, very fast, very sparkly. Um, what's remarkable about this movement uh, is the counterpoint. And here, too, um, you can look back to Mozart for precedent, uh, in particular his 41st symphony, his final symphony, the Jupiter Symphony. In the last movement of the Jupiter Symphony, um, you've got a magnificent fugue with multiple uh, motives, um, the likes of which had never really been written before in symphonic music. And Mendelssohn matches that achievement here at the age of uh, 12, uh, sorry, at the age of uh, 14, he writes uh, a quadruple fugue to end this movement. Um, I can't play it for you. I don't have the facility uh, at the piano to do it. Um, but when you hear this piece, listen in the last movement to the variety of motives that he's bringing uh, to bear in interplay in this magnificent fugue that he uh, ends the, uh, the, the movement with. Um, it's, it's an astonishing accomplishment for a young composer. Um, as I say, I don't know of any other composer who at this young age had that kind of ability um, in counterpoint and the ability to create fugues. Uh, but Mendelssohn clearly does. Um, and as you hear his music, as he goes on in his uh, very sadly very short compositional career, um, th this will come into play quite a lot. His music is always contrapuntal, even when it's not fugal. There are always lots of different voices uh, interplaying with each other. Um, the very end of the piece is suddenly where he breaks out of the classical mold. Uh, and you really hear where the future might be for Mendelssohn. Things get very dramatic. He takes it into a minor key, even though you've been in major for a very, very long time. Um, and he brings this, uh, this piece to a, a fantastic end. Some, some bits of humor are there, um, a presto to end the piece that's incredibly exciting. Um, but clearly, this is a young man that has quite a future ahead of him. Uh, I hope you will enjoy our concert. I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this little pre-concert lecture. Um, and uh, thank you so much for listening.